Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, let's, get, let's get started here. Today, we have a really exciting topic, really popular topic uh, for many people. We're talking about kitchen renovation mistakes to avoid. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. We are recording this today and we'll be sharing the video recording and the presentation afterwards. We will uh, we'll email that out um, by tomorrow. We had a lot of great questions in uh, submitted during the registration, um, but please also use the Q&A feature uh, in, in Zoom here as we get to that portion of the webinar. We, uh, we had a lot of great questions. We brought in some team members to help uh, handle all the Q&A portion at the end. Uh, and with that out of the way, I'd like to turn this over to Steve Scheinkoff, uh, CEO and owner of Yale Appliance. Steve, you want to take it away? Thank you, Pat. And thank you, everyone, for spending your Thursday 11 o'clock with me. Uh, 11 kitchen renovation mistakes to avoid. We'll start with the kitchen renovation mistake. This is a very well-conceived um, renovation, kitchen renovation. On the left, you see a barn door. Dennis McDonald, who you'll meet later um, uh, as one of our panelists, is a big fan of barn doors. Um, open, you have the hearth in the back, high ceiling is great, with one big mistake in the middle. We take a look at the um, cooktop, there's no ventilation. Now, I have a personal experience with this because I'm looking to buy a place myself. And I had the same problem. There's an apartment right off Tremont Street, beautiful place, and a red hot market's not being sold. Um, but let's see if we can fix this. Right? The only way you can fix this, now I'm assuming that everybody cooks a lot, like we cook a lot. Um, so if you're cooking a lot, the only real uh, choice you have is to get an overhead vent, which would be very hard to do. Um, and this because you got a tall ceiling, not impossible. You got a tall ceiling, so it'd be a custom fabricated hood. You couldn't do it in a condo because the upstairs neighbor, I'm sure, wouldn't appreciate your exhaust. Downdrafting is always um, is always bandied about as a design solution. But if you cook a lot, reversing gravity with smoke, steam, and heat going outside your house is not a good idea. Um, especially if you're going a long way, the static flow with an elbow won't work so well. So. The only thing you could do to save this kitchen, and this is a really nice kitchen, look at the detail of it all, you know, how everything matches up, uh, the lights with the, with the, with the uh, table and back, uh, the gray cabinets with the white cabinets, a nice job. The only thing I thought of doing was um, changing the sink, which would be on the left with the cooktop, get a 30 inch sink and maybe get a, uh, and uh, get the, and put the uh, cooktop on the other side. The only problem with that is, if you've got a 24 inch base cabinet, as many of us do in Boston, you can't put a 30 inch cooktop in without affecting everything else. So the problem with this, with the problem with the unit in Boston is you have to change everything. That one small mistake of putting a cooktop in the middle without ventilation is gonna trigger a whole renovation because that putting it on the other side means you gotta cut into the cabinets, the drawers, put a hood over it, change the plumbing, electrical, this isn't what I even consider a major mistake. This is what I consider kind of like a medium oversight. But these are the things that we want to avoid because that unit is still on the market in a red hot market. They're probably gonna, you know, it accentuates all the other mistakes in the unit. It's probably looking at two to $300,000 discount on a red hot, in a red hot market. And that's one of the things we want to avoid. Here are the other things. You know, we're gonna cover the gamut of the things you shouldn't be doing. Hiring the wrong people is obvious. Not, not knowing your lifestyle, we'll get into your lifestyle and how you plan a space. Thinking you have time, you're gonna get into cabinets. There were a lot of questions on cabinets. Placing your stove in the middle, you've already seen that. Not understanding ventilation. Um, in Massachusetts, we have makeup air laws that you have to be familiar with and get into that. Outside grills on the inside of your house, you wouldn't do that, but you probably put it on your three season porch. A lot of people are doing that. It's very popular in house. Stacking wall ovens is just dangerous. So we're gonna, uh, solve that problem. Downdrafting a, a professional uh, cooktop is, is just a bad idea that's gaining popularity. And then uh, appliance repair, because what we want to do is after you buy the stuff, we want to make sure you use it and enjoy it. And, and that can be a problem too. So remember, if that seems bad, if that seems like a lot, construction uh, 
is four parts, designing, scheduling, which we're gonna be talking about exclusively, then the construction, the closeout. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at the first big problem you have. The first three of the biggest is hiring the wrong people. Every nightmare story starts with the GC. Um, any kind of lawsuit or anything like that. And, and here's just the psychology of it. Great GCs don't hire bad subs because they want to move to the next job. And great subs don't work for bad GCs because they want to get paid. So it's very important that the, that the company that you hire knows what, you, knows what they're doing. You know, I put up the renovation of Hanover, we GC that ourselves. And one of the things is if you look at the facade of the old place that was all rotten. So we had to rip the whole facade off the building. The, 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 the guy we use, who you'll meet, uh, was up to task and we actually finished it on time, right? Because you're gonna have problems that we're gonna be talking about throughout your construction and you want a good GC to mitigate them. And here's some of the questions. And again, you don't have to write them all down because we're gonna be sending this to you. These are just 18. We have more in case you need them. But the ones I like the most are the ones that highlighted is, is basically, have you built new homes in the past? And if so, where? Like I live in a brownstone. So I wanna make sure that the people that, that renovate my place have done brownstones because there's some unique challenges. Do you have any references? That's a, 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 that's a must question. What do you see as the biggest challenges for this project? And what is your policy on project delays? Because your project is probably gonna be delayed due to uh, supply chain issues. But here's 18, feel free to use them. You're gonna get them in your uh, inbox, okay? Now, before I get to this, if you think you're done with the GC, you're about halfway there. Uh, one of my best friends is a developer in Boston and he had a wonderful uh, relationship with a, uh, a GC. Um, they finished a big building, complicated building, uh, on time and under budget, which doesn't explain why they're in uh, litigation against each other on the second building. And as he's telling me the story of, whoa, I can only think of one thing. I, and the one question I ask is, who's the project manager, right? And he's telling me how the old project manager had to go home to Portugal, they hired a new one. Um, and again, if you get the right GC, you don't want his kid who just got out of college to do your project. You want somebody like this, right? Now, Ricky is our, we're very fortunate to have him. He's on our panel too. He went out and got his GC license. He's got 27 years of experience, but pay very, you're probably not gonna get someone out of experience, but pay very close attention to the last thing. He's your point person on your subs. So plumbing, roofing, drywall, waterproofing, that's, that's what a house actually is. So you want someone familiar with the trades. So if they go off the rails a little bit, he can correct it before it becomes a big issue. So GC, project manager, you'll have a much smoother experience. But the best GC in the world, the best project manager can't help you if you don't know what you want, okay? So let's get into your lifestyle a little bit. Now, this is a picture of my sister's kitchen. My sister lived in uh, Medfield for years and had a small cottage in Falmouth. When her kids went to college, um, she decided to sell everything and move on the water in Falmouth. And in her own mind, all she wanted was, um, was overlook a window. Her, she wanted the window, she wanted to see the ocean and she wanted a coffee maker. Coffee makers on the left. Um, so much so that she didn't even want a TV like frettering the view. So she put the TV in the hood because all she really wanted was the view and the coffee maker. At the same time, as her kids were leaving, I was living in probably my favorite place. I lived in a uh, a fourth, I think a fifth floor walk up in the South End. Great place. You get in there, you know, had a nice view. It's a nice part of the city, right? Uh, fifth floor, fifth floor walk up didn't matter to me. Um, and then this happened. I went and got one of these. I got, my, my daughter was born and that fifth floor became a curse, right? Now in the South End, or if anybody familiar with Boston, right? there's a battle for a parking spot. So if you've got bundles and a kid, you're gonna bring the kid up to the fifth floor, bundles to the first floor, and then battle it up for that last parking spot. So when I moved across the street and redesigned a burned out brownstone, I put the kitchen in the basement. Uh, and the reason is, is because I could put the kid on the couch where she is now, get the, get the bundles, 
and have a nice smooth experience, nice tr smooth transition there. So really, here's some questions you wanna ask when you're doing your kitchen, right? Do you cook? How many people are cooking? How big is your space? What is the kitchen in relationship to the other rooms? Do you have an island? You know, how about windows? You know, for my sister, for anybody else, if you got looking overlooking, if you're in the suburbs, you want to see your kids in the back, in the, um, in the backyard, any objects you want to light. I mean, do you have children on your empty nester? Now, for all of you that are building a new house, you want to do your kitchens and baths first, obviously, because you've got electrical, plumbing, um, appliances, task lighting. I mean, you don't need task lighting really in your other rooms. Um, so do those first, and then the whole house just comes in order after that. Figure you have time. Um, I was on the phone with a friend of mine today and he's, he's excited about his new house. And uh, he says, uh, uh, I suspect the supply chain issues. He's a builder, he built Fenway Center. And I said, yeah, I mean, if you want a sub-zero refrigerator, it's six months at least, right? Because, you know, we have COVID hitting supply chains. Um, you know, people are putting more money in the house. So you get outsized demand. Here's one freak ice storm, you know, all the, um, all the insulation for refrigerators as whether you know or not comes from, out of Dallas and that factory was knocked out with that ice storm. So really you have to make decisions, um, right? As Ricky would say, your project manager's gotta be three steps ahead. If you're waffling on a decision in that one product that was available is sold, then you're pretty much, uh, uh, then, then you might have to wait another month and that will, delay the schedule for plumbing, electrical and everything else. So really what I want you to do is, what I think you should do is get your flow right and your lifestyle right and be willing to compromise aesthetics. Now, here's some of the lists that I had when I redeveloped um, uh, my, my brownstone. Here's some of the decisions, I can't believe it, right? You know, color your countertops, which white for your cabinets, cabinet hardware, what faucet am I gonna buy? What shower heads, what decorative lights, what shape is my bathtub? Now, should my bathtub match my overmount sinks? You know, do I buy ball wind hardware or is there another one? How about my vanities? Do I pick Sub-Zero, Wolf, Thermidor, and or Mila? And all I say is, you know, with, with product scarcity is worry about, like, instead of saying I want a Sub-Zero, say I want a built-in refrigerator because then you open yourself up to a Gaggenau, a Mila, a Blue Star, a True, um, rather than saying you want a Sub-Zero because if you're locking yourself into one particular brand, you're gonna wait and then you're gonna throw off your schedule. So pick the category and look at options. Now I'm not saying, you know, get the gold countertop uh, because it's the last one sticking over. It's the last remnant in a, in a granite yard. Just saying that a lot of the things that we look at, white and gray, gray and white, aren't gonna matter a year in once you moved in. So just be willing to compromise a little bit on your aesthetics and just get your flow. Not understanding cabinets and underpaying cabinet designers. I want to go back into my kitchen for a little bit because I had a really good designer. And she designed all the stuff that I didn't even know some exist, like platter. I've got a, I, some of the shelves are segmented the whole platters. I have a spice rack next to the um, next to the cooktop there. Pot top shelf. This is brilliant. There's a shelf just for pot tops. Because if you put your pot, if you have a shelf just for pot tops, that means you can stick your pots one to another and pretty much double your space. You get a garage on the right hand side for all your uh, for all your countertops. You know we decentralize the microwave because I don't really use a microwave. Um, glass cabinet for for hardware and of course under cabinet lighting. And I, I really think getting a good designer to help with all this stuff is really important. At the same time, let's look at a totally custom. This is Drake's. This is um, Manny who does the PowerPoint. This is his favorite kitchen. You're probably looking at about a $750,000 build out. That range, that's a La Carnu Chateau Supreme at $125,000 with a $20,000 hood. Okay, this is totally custom. Now, custom means you get to choose the sizes, finishes, um, sizes of everything. And there's four cabinets, right? That's a totally custom, built to order, very expensive. You think of like manufacturing, you're only manufacturing one, the costs go up, right? So if you're looking to save money, can you do it in a semi-custom with kind of like a nice wood, a nice veneer, maybe some customization. You can even go stock. 
typically most of the people on this call I suggest would, I, I would think would be semi-custom instead of custom. But the further down the row you get, the less expensive it could be. That said, RTA is not something, or ready to assemble, it's not something you wanna do if you wanna stick around a long time because it's typically particle board, doesn't last. I've seen RTAs with like the finish was kind of like almost stapled up over time. That's just gonna, that's just gonna come off. So if you can stay to a, a semi-custom stock, you can have better availability and, and less, and less uh, it'll cost you less. Placing a stove in the middle of the island, you know, the panelists and I are, are, are not of one mind on this. I think this is a mistake. Now, a lot of people say, well, I like to entertain my guests while I cook. I'm thinking, I'm like, you know, we cook a lot. I always, I'm always cleaning the backsplash of like, you know, food, grease, all that other stuff. So I'm not sure if your guests want to be entertained while you cook. But that said, if you want to do that, just understand there's only one way, especially if you cook, to efficiently exhaust, um, you know, uh, the, the grease. And that is, um, you know, I put a picture of Benihana. Everyone likes to entertain my guests when cooking. Well, they, they do that professionally. Right. Um, I do not recommend downdrafts. I think it's a last resort, um, and especially if you cook, they won't work. But think about what you need. That's an overhead hood. And you get something similar to that, probably without the water suppression. Those are commercial baffle hoods that will work just fine. But a lot of people don't want to do that because uh, it, it wrecks the sight line or you can't see your guests because they're covered by the hood. Um, but the only way to really efficiently do a range in an island is with Really, I think the best place, and, and, and I'm not a, we're not of one mind is this, is sinks. I think sinks in the middle of the island, I've always done it, are a great, by centralizing sinks, um, the old timers like me talk about the uh, kitchen triangle, which is never being one foot from what you usually use. You use the sink the most, and then it's your cooktop, and then it's your dishwasher. Think about it, you're not going to your oven every minute like stirring soup. You're not going to the refrigerator every minute. So you want to keep those three in a tight triangle. And by putting a sink in the middle, you pretty much accomplish that. And you know, with sinks today, you can always have a sink that entertains. This is the galley, but I'm sure there's tons of knockoffs where you can entertain just fine in the, in, on an island, in the middle of your sink, in the middle, in the middle of your kitchen. Let's talk about ventilation, because I think ventilation's misunderstood is probably the biggest kitchen fail, right? And there's nothing like a great, kitchen like the first one with a, with a failure in the middle to, to illustrate that. This is another beautiful kitchen. You're seeing an, another two tones of cabinets, one below, one above, D even different hardware. You can do that. The backsplash is beautiful. I like any non-subway tile because it's popular. They put a nice finish on there, but it won't work because the hood is only 21 inches deep and the, the range top is 24 inches deep. So what's gonna happen is the smoke's going to go billow past. And it's got a fire alarm right near that's going to set the fire alarm. So really what you want to know, I think a lot of people understand the first one is cubic foot per minute. 600 CFM means 600 cubes of air evacuated one minute time, right? But the capture is important because smoke is chambered and then evacuated. You can't get like a 1200 CFM pullout hood, which exists and expect it to, uh, expect to work. If, you're, if you cook, 24 inch deep is the minimum. If you really cook, 27 might be, might be the choice with uh, the pros, right? But this won't work, this, this particular installation. Let's talk about oversizing event. And originally I, I had the slide just for mass residents and I've been thinking a lot about it. Mass residents, um, if you live in the state, you've got makeup air, which means if you do a renovation, anything over 400 CFM uh, needs to be made up. And here's how the code works. It needs to be made up, it's gotta be 10 feet away on the other side of your kitchen because as air is uh, evacuated, you want an air intake on the other side. You can do that through your HVAC. You can do it with a smart damper system that Brone has when it turns on, it automatically turns on the makeup air. But I think makeup air is, 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 is really important. I know there's a lot of California, New York people on this call. Um, and I wanna show you, I wanna show you why. Um, by the way, this is the makeup air law. This is how you do it. Think about this, right? Um, what happens to your house is, you know, 1100 CFM, and we throw these terms out without understanding what 1100 CFM is. It's equivalent 
of a small room, right? So if you're evacuating, say you're in New York and you're evacuating 11 or a small room every minute, that's 33,000 cubes of air for 30 minutes. Now, air is always made up because air just doesn't like vacuum. You're not gonna fix it in your house. Instead, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get your air from your furnace, you're gonna get your air from your garage, you're gonna get your air from your attic. That's not really healthy air, right? Um, and, and there's new terms being bandied about as we understand. Everyone knows that we know where Yale's on the Southeast Expressway. Um, we all know about outside pollution, but there's new terms, specifically IAP and SBS. IAP is um, internal air pollution. Um, and so one of the other things is, let's say you're in Massachusetts, you plan your, you plan your hood right. How many times do people say, well, I never turn on the range hood? Well, there's, as they turn out, there's studies that say there's complications to that. You know, uh, a lot of kids have asthma. Um, when you're putting that kind of, you know, the gas, you're putting a gas fire in your house with a gas stove. In California is in, in the middle of outlawing gas stoves. Um, you know, all the emission that you're cooking from, um, they say their studies is 3.8 million deaths. And it's really interesting how they order it all. Uh, cooking and then smoking. So if you do the, if you get the makeup air, get the right ventilation, and then use the hood because it really does matter, right? So that's my ventilation rant. Now, this one's really interesting because it's so intuitive. Outside grills placed on the inside of your home. You wouldn't do that. We had one person who did in my 30 year history. Now we have a computer system that guards against even trying to do that. But you'd put it on your three season porch. And I've seen some installations like this and they're very popular in some magazines. Now to give you an idea, I know what that grill is. That's a, that's a 69,000 BT grill with a 23,000 BTU serum, which is an ultra ray broiler on there. So when you sear something, create a lot of smoke. Now, where is the smoke going? And the answer is somewhere in your three season porch or maybe in your house. So really grills are probably the most extreme stove you can buy. They belong on the outside or they belong with a really good, almost commercial ventilation system, period. But I would still say outside if you can. So I happen upon this picture that I just think it's kind of funny. Um, this one, this is, this is called a garage door, which is actually kind of cool if you're planning a kitchen, putting your garage doors and going up with them. But this one says, hey, um, you know, I can't taste my food. You know, they've got the nice table on the other side. Um, so remember, uh, grills stay on the outside, but not under garage doors if possible. This is another new trend. You know, a lot of people talk about centralized cooking. Um, yeah, um, I think you should centralize your cooking. Um, I think you should centralize your kitchen triangle, not so much cooking. Uh, this is uh, dangerous. You're seeing a lot more of it. And all I can think of is, uh, is uh, the average, um, the average a woman's five foot, five foot four to five seven. The average guy's with five eleven. This is eighty four inches tall. So think about this, like you're getting, a, you're putting a microwave on, you're getting a boiling hot soup and your kid is tugging at your uh, pant leg on the side because the chocolate's on the refrigerator on the right hand side. Um, just remember, if you've got an island, you get twice as much as your parents did and that microwave belongs in a drawer in your island, uh, not overhead. The most I would do would be single oven, steam oven, drawer, period. Um, anything over that is just dangerous. This is my least favorite picture on the internet. And it seems to be popular. Um, and it's just kind of segues to what I've been saying. Um, a lot of, especially the grill on the inside, that is a Wolf 16,500 BTU seal. There is no way you're gonna be able to downvent roughly 120,000 BTUs of heat. And unfortunately, this is something that you can't come back from uh, unless you put an overhead hood which would be way too much expensive when, the, uh, when your construction is done. This is just something you just stay away from and don't do. Um, you know, Brown's advertising their new, their new Katura, which is you can vent anything with the, with the range. I, I really strongly recommend the fact that reversing 120,000 BTUs of heat with an infrared, with an elbow, going long distances just can't be done. And last, Certainly not least, especially if you live outside of Massachusetts, you know, 
your local appliance store, most of which don't have service, and that's okay, I guess. Um, you know, the excuse that when you say, you know, am I going to get the new, am I going to get my new stove fixed or my new, and they'll say, well, the manufacturer will always handle it. And that's just not the case. I mean, uh, we're almost two and a half to one in service and install over actual sales. Um, I think really one of the, uh, the questions you got to ask, and we touched on it before, Sub-Zero Wolf, um, Mila, Thermidor, one of the answers to that question is which one in your area can be fixed the quickest? Because it's one thing to buy the right stuff, it's another to get it fixed. And appliances are getting smarter. I know Wolf's coming out with the new smart appliance series in September, Jane Eyre has it, Mila's coming out with theirs, everything is going to intuitive touch, someone's gonna have to fix it. If you're buying that stuff, that has to be part of your investigation before you buy. So let's conclude with the greatest president of the United States, one of the two anyway, give me six hours to chop down a tree. I will spend the first four sharpening the ax and so should you. Really before you start, you start by getting the right people, um, especially. Uh, remember that construction is just simply design scheduling that's where you want to spend most of your time. Construction and closeout should flow from there. You should be in the hunt for good people, good GCs, PMs, and subs. You know, you can understand how you're going to use the space, start with the kitchen and bath. You can plan. But once you start, once the shovel hits the dirt, move decisively. You want to give your project manager time to get this done. Be willing to compromise on aesthetics, not your lifestyle. You can do this. So with, the, uh, with that in mind, let me introduce the panel. We're so lucky to have Ricky Robitaille, who I mentioned as our project manager slash general contractor slash head of our facilities slash starting our installation. Um, him and Dennis, who's the VP of sales, who they've probably together built at least 50 kitchens. If any of you know Yale, you know, Framingham is all new and then redesigned because the first it wasn't good. They did, they did Hanover. I think Dennis understands merchandising products um, tile, cabinets, um, he's got his pulse and all that stuff, and on product, because uh, we can answer products too. Um, also, you know, Pat's marketing director, he's kind of the um, brains behind the operation, and Manny, who does all the PowerPoint. I always say, I'm going to learn PowerPoint, but Manny does it so much better than me. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Pat, and we're going to answer your questions as best we can. Awesome, Steve. Thanks a lot. Um, we have a ton of questions to get through. I'm just going to start firing them uh, at our panel here and keep using the Q&A to send in questions that come up uh, or that you have in mind here. Uh, I'm just going to dig into our list. Um, we talked about, uh, so there's a question, any special considerations when putting the main sink in an island? We talked about that briefly. But what, are, what might be some considerations to help you decide? I'll hop in there real quick if it's okay. I would say, um, you know, if it's if it's new renov if it's a new construction, all things are probably possible. If it's renovation, just the cost of getting plumbing to that space if it's not there already. Um, the bigger thing is the size of the island, and if you're going to plan on people sitting on it. So, it's always the yin and yang of form and function. And I always say to people that your kitchen functions Monday through Friday, but it's when you have people over or a large uh, gathering that you really appreciate a well-designed kitchen. If you're putting a sink in an island, just if people are going to be sitting there, is there going to be any splatter behind it? Does it look off into the living room? And if you were entertaining, is the sink going to be big enough and allow you enough working space within it um, that dishes aren't bubbling over in it uh, when you load it? Is your dishwasher, to Stephen's point earlier, going to be in close proximity to that sink? Because if you have a sink in an island and your dishwasher's behind you, think of those movements. You're going to rinse it. Now you got to turn into the flow of the kitchen awkwardly, open the door and load it. So it's not only a sink, it's is the plan then going to be a dishwasher next to it and all those variable things. So we see it a lot in a prep sink. In a main sink, certainly we do see it. You just want to consider how are you going to use that space and will the sink function for you um, all the time. All right, great, great, thank you. We'll switch it up to cabinetry. Um, thinking about keeping the current cabinet boxes and ordering new doors and painting. Do you see any issues fitting new appliances? 
Yeah, I, I would say they're uh, not necessarily fitting new appliances by putting doors on the front, if that's the question. Um, I think the, the question to, to be concerned about is, you know, depending um, where you live and contractor and to the quality of cabinet face you're going to put on them is what is the cost of all that? Because to Stephen's point again earlier, if you're going to do all this work to kind of um, reface your existing cabinets, could you have perhaps found a stock or, or even a semi -cap custom cabinet in, 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 um, in close relation to cost? Additionally, when you do those types of things, painting cabinets, refacing cabinets, the actual cabinet boxes, the structure themselves, is it MDF, is it particle board, or is it solid, is it three quarter inch plywood and a better quality product so that your money spent today holds up, even though it will look good today, will it hold up three and four and five and six and seven years ago down the road, perhaps like a new space would. So just considerations there. It, to me, uh, you know, it's funny, I, I uh, you know, one of the things is I was trying to, you know, uh, buy a house near my grandparents at one time and you could tell they painted the, 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 the cabinet it's just like you painted the cabinet um so really the the the, co the if you get hiring a contractor what's it going to look like um because you don't want people to know you're painting it um you want the job to be good and you know i, I think in a lot of cases it's a matter of cost too and, and to dennis's point i mean can you get new cabinets for the same price that you're refacing, what does the interior of that cabinet look like as well? Um, and back to ventilation a little bit. Do, do over the range microwaves work? We would need a recirculating attachment. What hood with recirculating would you recommend? Um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Steve. <laughs> you know, we both would like to hop on this one. <laughs> we get asked this question constantly. I, I gotta be honest here. Um, even though I've been honest, is um, you don't have any kitchen fails if you don't use the kitchen, right? So really the first question is, how do you cook? Because if you're gonna cook a lot, an over the range microwave hood is not what you want. And as, as Dennis and I, Dennis has been here for 20 years, I've been here for 36. And over that time, BTU outputs have increased. Whereas now a basic gas range Whereas when I first started, it was like eight to 10,000 BTU. The least expensive self-cleaning whirlpools now get two 15,000 BTU burners. And a microwave in dimension, I believe is only what? 16 inches deep. So you're gonna have some problems with that. I, I think that if you cook a lot, um, I would really strongly discourage you from buying an over the range microwave. That said, it's really hard to do because the four piece packages, the microwaves are throw-ins anyway. But the more you use the kitchen, the more critical ventilation becomes. But let's, I do want to stay on that for one second, because still there's many times where you just can't get the vent out. And then the question becomes, which recirculating appliance will work better? And to answer the question of a microwave in general concept, think about what it's trying to be. It's trying to be a light above your stove. It's trying to be a cooking vessel in some form. And it's also trying to be a vent. And it does all of those things just okay. None of them very well. Um, you know, one thing, so, so just to know, that's a microwave. It is shallow. You generally cook on your front two burners, which are closer to 23, 24 inches in the front, where to Steve's point, that microwave is set back closer to 16. But, but as much as anything, so, so, okay, maybe it's not a microwave. So now let's move on to the question of the hood. The question on the hood is this. Um, if you're going to recirculate between the two, recirculating is recirculating. There is not a better version of recirculating, if that's the question. The recommendation would be to make sure that when they install it, so many people install a recirculating hood and don't even know that the charcoal filters that come with the microwave or the hood are important, A, to be put in there at the time of install. Many installers throw them out. They look nothing more than a carbon pad, if you will. And then additionally to that, you replace them. And most people will say, wow, I have a recirculating microwave. I've never replaced them. I don't even know where they'd be. So um, to that end, they should be replaced again, to Steve's point, how often you cook. Still not gonna be a, the best venting, but it will ca catch some of the smoke and grease. Um, better than not having a car, uh, the filter in there at all. The, the final thing would be to say though, if it were my choice and you said, hey, we have to recirculate, I would always pick the hood and I would find a place with a microwave. And the reason for that, more than anything aesthetically, is you're doing under cabinet lighting. And under cabinet lighting today is generally 3000 Kelvin or what Steve said earlier is task lighting, a natural light that you can work with. 
And when you get to a microwave hood, invariably, generally, they use an incandescent or a very low powered LED uh, driver for those hoods. And, it, and you have this beautiful run of kitchen and it's great, great color, great color, great color. You get to the microwave and it goes kind of yellow or it gets blue. It doesn't show off the decorative tile many times that's on that backsplash. So a hood many times, while it won't vent better, it will do two things. It looks a little more high end, so maybe a little better resale, but more than anything, it'll give you a better uh, light source. So you should have more options for a better light source. Let's, let's stick with ventilation. Uh, there's a question from an attendee here. Uh, a 36 inch range with six burners on the, they have a 36 inch range with six burners on an island. Planning uh, the best catcher or downdraft. What are your thoughts? Okay, oxymoron. So 36 inch range in an island should never be vented. Now I'm gonna tell you, you're gonna to go to a manufacturer's site, you're gonna pick up an Arc Digest magazine, you're gonna see a pretty fit, glossy picture that a photographer and an architect came up with a way to put this in. And it's a common thing people want, but it will 1000% will not work. Simply put, it will not. It's a great visual, but it won't, it's, there's no function to it. You know, it makes for a great picture, because you, you, you can see your windows and everything else. But truth be told, I mean, it, the more you cook, the more you need a vent. And if you're gonna put probably 90, 90 to 100,000 BTUs in your kitchen, you should have a place for it to go effectively. And you know, one of the things is like, you know, there's, a, there's a group out there called CAG, California Electric Group, and they're way behind, they're, they're behind getting rid of gas because it creates environmental you know, air pollution, what they're talking about. It's just, it's just crazy. You need to, you need, if you're going to put a pro in and use it, it needs to be ventilated properly. Yeah, or yeah we, we get that question a lot. I mean, a down you don't use it, then, then by, by all means, get a downdraft. It looks better. So downdrafts, why do they exist? I got to answer this because the questions keep coming up about it. One, we've never put just a, a downdraft ever on an island or a rear wall with a downdraft, even if a manufacturer specific, specification say they could. We're different from most appliance dealers, folks. We deal with the problems after the fact, and we actually own them and try to help people with them. Uh, so it's never in our interest to just tell them what they want to hear. It's sometimes what they need to hear. In the case of a downdraft, though, do they exist? Do, why do they exist? Why do they work? Well, because there are sometimes, as a last resort, you have nothing else. If the question was you had a 36-inch pro range in the island, and, and would, you, would it be worth it to spend the money uh, to try to stick a downdraft behind there because you're unhappy with the venting, I would say, do not waste your money. Open a window. Good Lord, I just hate to go through all that work to not get a better result. If you're putting a downdraft in, if, you, if, if, you, if, if all things are lost and that's what you have to do, then I would just tell you, focus on the height of the downdraft. There's brands like Thermador, Bosch that get up closer to 12, 13, 14 inches in physical height. So when you have a stock pot, an average stock pot is 12, 14 inches of height. So air will be pulled horizontally much better than it will want to be sucked back down with a lower, lower downdraft, if that makes sense. So hopefully we just, we answered that. But we, yeah, you're going to find we're, we're big anti-downdraft folks just because we live with all the horror stories of beautiful kitchens. And now we're trying to fix what was already in and it's, it's a big problem, hindsight. Another, another common question here, Ricky, maybe you chime in on this one. Yeah. Uh, I want to buy a dual fuel range and have gas presently. How do I know if I have enough amperage and how do I replace if I don't? Well, I mean, I guess we start off with the, the sales rep, him providing the proper spec sheets, you know, uh, to get those correct figures when it comes to getting the proper amperage, whether it be 30 amps, 40 amps, 50 amps, uh, and then take it back to your designer and uh, get in touch with an electrician just to see, I mean, if you're in a basement apartment uh, as like uh, Steve is, his kitchen's in the basement, uh, kind of tough without getting other contractors involved, snake and wires, because now you're talking, you need a drywall, a plaster, a painter to fix, you know, the situation to get the proper amperage to the location. Uh, so I would, I would certainly uh, start there. As, as, Another simple way to, to determine is uh, take a look at the, uh, if it's a pre-existing house and uh, it was, you didn't build it per se, 
take a look at the uh, the electrical panel and see at some point it, it'd be identified as a oven circuit. So maybe before they had all gas, they did have an electric oven there. So that's a couple of things to, to take into consideration. Yeah, and people ask that a lot. They ask us, hey, I, I have all gas. I want to go to a dual fuel. I understand I need to go to a 40 or a 50 amp circuit uh, versus what a 20 is today. And I think the net effect is um, sometimes it's not a big deal at all. To Ricky's point, your panel has the power already or it's not a big deal for an electrician. Sometimes your panel may have the power, but to Ricky's point, it may be very hard to pull what a 20 amp circuit wire is small and a 40 amp, 50 amp circuit wire is gonna be much bigger. It has more uh, copper material in there. So pulling it through the house and getting it to where it's gonna go could be the hidden cost. But I always tell people it starts with a, a quick look at your panel perhaps, but really getting a professional in and giving you an estimate on what it costs. Because sometimes it's not that big a deal at all. And other times it can be kind of a shock after the fact. So just wanna put it before you make your final decision, make sure what you're in for there. Great, thank you. So, uh, this is a question we, we're dealing with a lot right now. Um, since appliances take a long time to receive, is it better to order appliances first? Yes. Um, <laughs> and in cabinet people, you know, we're not, not acting out of self-interest. We're not even just talking about lead times, but um, cabinet people are gonna be handcuffed if, if you don't buy appliances first. How are they gonna draw in um, you know, their kitchen? And really um, the, the big decision you need to make with appliances is really cooking. Now, refrigerators, you're probably gonna get a 36 inch cabinet. Dishwashers are almost always 24, unless you're putting an 18 inch in your pantry, you got a smaller kitchen. Um, so really this decision revolves around placement and whether you're gonna go with a cooktop wall oven or a full range. That's the big appliance decision, everything else. And then you got your ancillary stuff. Where you are gonna put say a microwave drawer, a warming drawer, a, you know, refrigerator drawer, if you have kids and you wanna put fruit and yogurt in, in the other thing. But, if you ever want to get a charge to your um, to your kitchen designer, just say, "Hey, uh, I, I know I said I wanted an all range. Now I want to go uh, uh, cooktop and and double oven. See what they think. Two totally different kinds of kitchens. And with lead times, you need to order appliances like they are cabinets. Typically, people gave us maybe two to six weeks. Now, on a sub zero or some of that other stuff, you may need six eight months. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's go back to ventilation. Uh, how can an exhaust hood be pointed straight up in a two-story house with an attic? Eventually the pipe needs to bend to exit the house on the side. How do you deal with that? So a couple of things when you're venting a hood that, that you wanna pay attention to is keep the run as straight as possible. You try to never restrict the physical duct itself. So if the hood itself calls for a six inch round duct or an eight inch round or 10 or whatever it calls for, you want to try to keep the integrity of the size duct they ask for. You want solid duct as opposed to flexible duct because solid duct is smooth and will have less restriction on the ear. So it'll be a lot quieter in performance. Know this, and this is what some people don't factor in. Every time you take a 45 or a 90 degree elbow to get this hood out of the house, I have a lot of people that say, well, geez, I only need a small hood. I'm only going 10 feet or 15 feet. But then they tell me it's three or four or five turns to get there, to get around these. Well, that's that every time you take a turn, it can be anywhere from four to 10 feet equivalent. So a 90 degree turn is more like eight to 10 feet of actual straight duct run every time you turn this thing. But to your point, keep it straight. When you do have to connect solid vent together, we wanna to tape that, uh, take, the, take those joints, again, to keep that ear not having a restriction, to keep the noise down. And um, after that, in an existing house with two stories and trying to go out your attic, it's just, uh, you know, what are the floor joists and everything that are in that ceiling, you're gonna penetrate those two floors. To, uh, you know, can you get the integrity of the duct up in the straightest form and fashion before you take a right angle out or however you have to exit the house? I hope that answered the question. Yeah, ventilation is about gravity. Go up, it's where the smoke's going, just lead it there. Mm. Ventilation's uh, been really popular. Um, a question, uh, one more ventilation question. Do you need a ventilation hood in a condo building? 
So it depends on the condo building. So a lot of condo vertical buildings, um, certainly uh, a trend is to start, well, I shouldn't answer this. A large condo building, three, four, 100 units. Many times it's less expensive when they initially build it to not vent outside the house and penetrate the exterior of the house. Um, and they will do recirculating. The other way you'll sometimes see is that the condo will have a chase or it'll have a main big pipe that runs for all these kitchens. And your one kitchen, your, your hood and your kitchen just ties into this main duct that they run up. So there could be some restrictions there. Uh, the final is smaller condos, townhome type condos may have an exterior possibility, but really, I guess to answer that question, you'd wanna ask your condo association or the folks in there, uh, are there any uh, parameters or things that you have to work within or covenants to say, hey, you can't vent exteriorly at all or a maximum CFM hood. So it's really on a case by case condo basis. Yeah, historical society may have something to do with it. Yeah. You don't see it, you don't see it in large projects because it co actually costs a thousand bucks to, to drill a hole. Yeah. But a lot of condos don't want to see, to Steve's point, penetrations. You know, there's a hundred, hundred different little, you know, ducks exiting the home on the outside. So, they don't want to, they don't want to it. yeah. So, uh, keep using that QA feature to send in questions here. We're coming up on about 10 minutes left. Uh, we'll make it through as many questions as we can live here. And then we can follow up afterwards with everybody um, if we don't do, if we don't get to them. Um, let's go uh, arrange decision, uh, range decision. Thermador Pro Harmony 36 inch with six burners versus the Miele 36 inch six burners. Are we talking dual fuel or all gas? All gas. All gas? All gas. And I see V and H in there with a lot of questions and we're happy. I'm gonna follow up with V and H or one of us will one to one because there's a lot of particular questions. Um, Steve can go into what he thinks the, between those two, but I know you're all clearly designing a kitchen and you're between final decisions there, and some of them are very granular, which we can help you with. The grandy is 27 inches. The meal is the, the meal will fit the car is 24. Yeah. Meal will have a, it's a more cleanable range. They designed it to be that way with the um, the grates are dishwasher safe. The racks you can leave them self clean. Yeah. They're both. They are both. Um, um, uh, they both have, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the the Pro Grandy. It's got the twenty two thousand. Um, yeah, but he's between a Pro Harmony. He wants a Harmony. So the oh, Harmony, uh, Harmony's yeah. uh, Harmony. Uh, first of all, the meal is self cleaning. Harmony's not. Uh, Harmony is actually can be on that gas. So so the the thing the the couple things there would be depth twenty four and five sixteenths on a on a on a Harmony of five eight. So a little more tight to your cabinet. So if you're doing an inset cabinet, might be a consideration slightly more flush versus twenty six and three quarters on the Miele. Not the end of the world there. Um, the things that you hear good and bad out of both. Um, the thermometer is going to have more power on the average burner across 18,000 on most of them, 15 on one or two, but with an extra low simmer feature. So you can vary them um, down to an off and on cycle. Has a star burner, which the concept is, you know, more, more flame to the pan in a lower fashion. Um, that, those are some, some things uh, on the Miele. Um, still plenty of power on the top. Uh, you know, self-clean in both. Um, to Steve's point, easier cleaning racks uh, inside and, and on the top, a dishwasher safe. Um, you know, both both similar in price. I think one's $72.99, $169.99. So similar price points there. The Thermidor, you're gonna get a free dishwasher when you when you buy that uh, as part of their current promo nationally. Um, so, you know. Clock, you get a clock and timer with the meal. You gotta check the harmony to see if it's self cleaning, but. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Miele's got the 19,000 in the front, but 12 in the back, whereas Thermidor is 18 and 50. Yep. Uh, they ramp theirs down. Uh, you get clock and self cleaning on, on Miele. You got to check the harmony, but I know that the racks um, on the Miele are the only ones that are self cleaned. Final thing to know is nationally, Thermidor is about to have a price increase. Someone had asked earlier, do you buy products for availability? You do. I'll also tell you this, there's very little promotion, if zero promotion going on for most of fiscal 2021, basic supply and demand. They can't fulfill, uh, so they're not gonna promote what they can't sell, uh, make enough of. But beyond that, price increases. I mean, we're seeing price increases constantly across the board. I would estimate 10% by year end. Most brands right now are somewhere between a, a five and 8% price increase right now. Um, everyone just blinks, so it seems to be everyone's having them in the next 30, 60 days. 
Um, my point to you is normally you might time those things for dollars saved and say, oh, I'll wait for this promotion or I know they have an annual sale. Don't wait for any sales. I don't think they're coming anytime soon in 2021. And quite honestly, I so. I Black Friday may be the first. If you're lucky. Um, yeah. And not on premium brands generally. So, but, but VH, we'll, we'll get to you one-to-one -one because I can see a lot of your other questions. They're good ones, but they're, you know, very specific. Uh, a really common question here. Should all your appliances be from the same manufacturer? I want a steam convection wall oven, but not every manufacturer makes one. Uh, I'm doing an induction range. What is, so what are the considerations of purchasing from the same brand? Yeah, I mean, I would say they are generally our highest end kitchens are a mix of brands many times because some brands do some things better than others. Um, so I, I think you'll see that. And I think Steve showed a, a screenshot of that, that kitchen that Manny loves. That's a hundred thousand. And that's a mix of brands. Now it's a $700,000 kitchen. It, it can afford whatever it wants, but but case uh, point be, be made that many times um, it doesn't have to be exactly the same brand. It's something like a steam oven, which Steve talks about all the time and demos on, you know, steam ovens are not all equal. You know, there's some that absolutely you can cook in and do far more with uh, one brand versus another as a mealer or example, or a Gaggenau steam oven, really, you know, not, not many competitors to those two brands specifically when we get to the granular level. So I think it's a yin and yang of having it all look good. Stainlesses generally will mix in, 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 a, in a spread out kitchen, as long as everything's not one stacked on top of each other, but, but really focus on how you're gonna use it and how important the features that they offer are and do a little bit of research one-to-one -one, because every brand does something maybe a little bit better than the other, large part. Um, yeah, the other thing is, <clears throat> if we're talking about aesthetics, like you wouldn't put a meal of steam oven over a wolf wall. It, it's just, it just looks different. But you could put a, a meal of steam oven on the other side of the kitchen and have a wolf cooking somewhere else if you need to. Um, but it really depends. And it really depends what you actually value. Um, if it's the steam that's driving it, you know, the two that dominate, that's, that's meal of wolf. Um, if you're looking for single ovens, well, then the choice of open really depends. We have a, uh, I mean, we have a chef that does steam a lot, uh, if you're interested, um, you know, package it in the next, um, uh, steam somehow. Yep. Yep. Uh, another common question we're dealing with right now has the supply chain for appliances improved at all? What lead times do you recommend? Yes. Yeah. So oh gosh. I'll tell you again here. So we 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 predicted 2021 would be far worse than 2020. And it's counterintuitive to what many people probably on the call are thinking. You're thinking things are getting slightly better. We're seeing the end of the light with uh, restrictions and vaccinations and, and maybe a, a curve in our favor for a chance. But the reality of it is, if, if you just Google ports have been backed up, microprocessors, which uh, run everybody, I don't know if anyone remembered a while back, Texas um, had an ice storm not a while back, took out the plant that made all the foam insulation for 90% of the refrigerators out there. So um, the answer is we'd be lying to say we think it's getting better. We see pockets of things but every day we're throwing another major curveball. So I can only tell you this, wherever you're buying appliances, get way out in front of it, really. It's not a pitch, it's not a close, it's a, it's a just get in line. You'd rather be at the top of someone's line um, you know, than the bottom of another. And, and just, you can always cancel for most deals. Last chance, if you had to, you can always generally make a change or cancel, but can't get at the top of that line any faster. Plan six months. Yeah. Plan for six months. You'll be fine. Steve awesome. just uh, actually wrote an article on our blog uh, going into, into some detail on that topic exactly um, in the past week or two. Uh, one more question about makeup air. Um, just bought a, just bought a Thermador 36 inch dual fuel with a Zephyr hood, uh, 1200 CFM. Installing them, um, installing them and don't have forced air in my house. How can, I easily handle, how can I easily handle makeup air without investing a fortune? Uh, a concern is bringing in uh, cold air during the winter. Let's, uh, let's let Ricky answer it. You're sitting there. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of kits that you can, if, if you don't have forced air in your home, there's a couple of kits. Braun makes one, as Steve mentioned, uh, uh, that you could uh, you you could pipe from the outside, which then the low voltage wire that goes up to your hood, uh, 
and when you turn on your hood, it activates the damper, a damper opens up and it, it, it allows fresh air into the home. Um, so the downside to that is when you're doing a brown, you don't have forced air and you're not tying in the HVAC. To your point, you will you will get some some cold air. It's not a it's it's not a a powerful cold draft. It's just uh, maybe opening equal to opening your window, maybe a half inch to get that fresh air. Yeah. So if you have an existing form, picture it like this: you have a duct coming out of your hood. There'll be a, a piece that we're going to stick in there. This, this piece has, has a damper inside. When you turn your hood fan on, this damper slowly opens and allows the air to push out. There is a lead that will go, you'll have to run down somewhere generally into your basement or whatever, and we make a small hole outside. This is all in a kit. We're talking for a cost of a kit. Uh, don't quote me on this, probably somewhere around $600, $700. But you will have to replace that air. You will push that air outside and take it back in. But when that fan is not on that damper at your hood will actually close it's it's in line it just pivots it's so, a smart it's a smart damper like yeah. there's videos online all over the place that show a literally a tutorial on how it works but again you, you know if, if you're talking i don't know i mean it, it, i don't know if you pull permits or something but typically um and ricky you'd have to uh, an inspector would would not sign off on something without makeup air at this point, but you got to make up air somewhere. Um, the other thing is if you're going to cook with your new pro range and your 1200 CFM, just remember you're getting 1200 cubes of air out of your house per minute, open a window on the other side of your house if need be, but um, just you're going to create a very unhealthy environment for family if you don't. And with the, with the, with the new, home, new homes being more and more airtight, that became, becomes a, a bigger issue rather quickly uh, when you're when you're venting your uh, your stove with yeah. a closed cell, open cell, foam. These these houses are becoming like a vacuum seal bag uh, nowadays. So it's, it's good for energy efficiency. You know they want lead certification, passive home certification. A lot of these builders probably get grant money for it. Problem is, is that what happens going out? How do you make that up? And that's something you, you, you really got to consider for your family. All right, great. We're, we're coming up on time here. I think I think that's a nice way to end it. Um, we have a lot of questions to follow up on, so uh, we will be in touch. Uh, we, we're we're saving all. Do of you have Do you have more time, Dennis? I I have more time if 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 we want to answer some macro ones. The very very specific product ones for the minutiae of they're between two. Yeah, uh, we can we can answer that. We can answer those one to one. Yeah, because if, it might if go people want to stay and ask questions, I I don't have anything till uh, you know one o'clock. So you know, okay. if, if people have got major problems. Let's let's solve them now instead of uh, getting back to them at a different time. So okay, there's a few more macro level ones for sure. Um, let's go. Uh, would you recommend a double wall oven? Over a pro range, what kind of what kind of goes into that decision? Um, it, it really, first of all, it depends on the space because you're still going to need um, you got a double wall, and you're still going to need a spot for your range time. Okay, so one thing is space. Um, wall ovens, I prefer um, because you don't have to bend. Um, there's a lot more features to wall ovens, although that is changing, where you can get. You know, you could put something really customized, like, you know, a steam module over a single oven and a warming drawer, right? Where you can customize that double oven to some degree. Um, um, you know, ranges, one is uh, you, can, you can centralize your cooking in one spot versus the ergometrics um, of, of the wall oven. That's really your main decision and how much space you have as well and what you really want for cooking. Um, so if you think of those four things, then, then you, you make the choice based on that. Yeah, and the function there is, you know, again, when you're entertained, it's busy. If you could fit anything and everything was possible, uh, double ovens with a, with a cooktop or range top, in my opinion, are always superior because it breaks up the flow of the kitchen. You can imagine Thanksgiving, someone's on the cooktop and you need to get something out of the oven. Everyone's hovered over this one spot. It's nice to be broken up to allow flow and, and people to help and work in the kitchen. The second to that though, 
depending when you get the size, if you're in a 48 inch range, for instance, if you were getting something that big in a pro, you could buy double ovens and a range top, basically replicate two full size 30 inch ovens, as opposed to a 48 inch range, which has a 30 inch oven and a smaller 18 inch oven. You could get double ovens, break up the flow for many times the same, if not less than having bought the all in one range. Um, I think, you know, on a straight resale value, most people don't walk into a home, see two ovens and a range top and say, oh, I hate this kitchen. But some people will, depending on the market, look at an all-in-one range and say, yeah, I love it, but man, I really need two ovens. So I, I just think it really, uh, if, if all things are possible, I'd really push, push the double oven route if you could. The, the other thing, just as a segue, is a lot of people go with double ovens and never use the bottom oven. You know, a lot of people that are looking for resale forgetting that they got to live in the moment. So really, I mean, if you're that type of person that's not using the lower oven, then, then really consider an ancillary oven put on top of a single. Uh, steam, speed, uh, microwave drawer below uh, are all good alternatives to a, to a double oven. Uh, next up, I'm renovating my kitchen, trying to decide the direction of the island in relation to an adjoining living room. Is there a rule of thumb um, facing the living room or perpendicular? What are the considerations there? Um, to me, only because I planned two islands in the last renovation, it's like how much space you had uh, wall to wall. Mm. Um, is It's really how I plan my island. So if you look at, you know, I've got a, a family room and then the kitchen and the island is in the middle of the kitchen. Whereas if you wanted to face the family room, it would be on the other, it would be uh, swapped, but then I would have no lateral space left to right. So that would be the, that would be, that's, that's how I plan my island. Really depends, every, 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 uh, every question is, is, every space is different and how you use it is different. Opening it up to a living room, I don't know. Uh, it depends on where you put in the dishwasher as well, noise and everything else. I kind of like the way I did it, even though it, it, it doesn't, I think it does flow. I think if you put it the other way, it wouldn't flow as well. So worry about flow in the, in the space as well, side to side. Um, this is there's a question about cooking. What are the best ovens for baking cookies and cakes, et cetera? Um, I bake a lot and cook, and I'm considering a double wall oven for a range. Is one better than the other for baking? You know, definitely, I would say for baking, um, you know, and, and it, I saw this question. I'm looking at some of the questions come up. There was a question earlier about a gas oven versus electric wall oven. So just if we're talking about ovens in general, generally, while well, wall ovens you want, it's going to be electric. That's really going to be your option. Um, but electric is a more universal heat and in a wall oven, it's where it's going to be electric. Um, electric ovens bake, broil and roast pretty well. A couple of things to consider would be a convection, at least one of the ovens, if it's a double oven or to have convection in an oven um, so that you can multi-lever cook. So the example of cookies, uh, you don't have to take the top rack out and rotate them in the bottom because one's cooking faster than the other. The convection fan will circulate that heat more consistently. Um, Second to that, I would just say uh, really coming down to the actual um, ovens themselves. So, you know, it, we could get really deep on this. You could talk about wolf, wolf wall ovens where it has a true preheat, um, two convection fans, moves the ears, air really, really well. Um, I guess it would just come into price range and everything else and really what you want to spend. But I think most ovens today are come with convection. Is the convection itself true convection, what actually has a heating element there in, a, in addition, or just a glorified fan? Just things to consider. But, uh, you know, we, we could get into them. I mean, KitchenAid would be a great mid, mid level um, double wall oven. Love it uh, for the utilitarian, good looking, good value, performs well. On the high end, you know, uh, uh, Miele, um, Thermidor and Wolf, probably three brands strong to consider right there. Um, you know, we might look at some other details when you're in it. Yeah, it really depends what you're baking too. Like if you're baking bread, you may want the uh, meal because it's got the steam assist to it, um, which adds moisture, which is essential in baking bread, that type of stuff. Um, that would be a good one to consider. 
um, you know, the Wolves got the Vertacross blowers, which uh, are a little more efficient than the fans. They also have more space. Even, you know, Dennis, I, I happen to like the KitchenAid too. It's just a big, basic oven, five cubic foot convection oven. Um, um, but really, a lot of the convection, if I get the heat in the back, you're fine. You know, gas is moisture. Gas is better for roast, uh, roasting and way better for boiling, especially for the infrared. So that's the difference. But you're going to go electric in a while. We, uh, we touched on this in the presentation a little bit. Um, question about, is it okay to grill on a screen porch? Do you need a vent hood in that situation? Yeah. <laughs> it, anytime, anytime there's a roof over a grill, like downdrafts, you are gonna see a shutter to answer that question because invariably we've seen it all. It's a great concept. We all want a hood over us. So it never rains when we grill and we love grilling 300 and you know, 52 days every day of the year. That said, I would never give a recommendation to ever do a grill with a roof over. I'll tell you what the solution is, if you really want a solution to this, because I was involved uh, with a project 10 years ago. Um, it's one of our contracts before they started using us. And they wanted me to go over, so I, I brought some like chicken sausages over um, to the, this beautiful three season porch, and they put this little ventilator in. And I'm like, this won't work. Here's, Here's the other thing you don't worry about if you grill. You got to make sure that when you build in that grill, the cover goes all the way down. Because what happens is the cover doesn't go all the way down if you don't build in right. It becomes like a snorkel that just like uh, it just like pushes the air, it pushes that smoke out. So one sausage in this 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 beautiful three season porch was like engulfed. But here's how they solved the problem on their own dime. They had to put in a commercial vent because wouldn't you know it, um, the 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 uh, the guy uh, the customer actually had a chef on staff in his house, so they used it all the time. They had to put in I think it was a twenty thousand or twenty five thousand cfm twenty seven inch deep with a roof blower on the top to to evacuate um, to evacuate all the smoke. It cost them I think on the this is this is ten years ago, so uh, I think it was the final number was somewhere between thirty-five and forty thousand dollars to to destroy what they did and rebuild what they needed. But the problem uh, solved. Maybe get a really nice raincoat, a really nice one, a lot less expensive. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but uh, wall oven a speed oven combo unit, or should you buy them as two separate units? I mean, I'll tell you if you could do if you could do two uh, separate and you're happy with the design, I'd always do two separate. Just because God forbid you had an issue with one versus the other, it's contained in a singular unit. The all-in-one is a simple solution, fits into one cutout. It's nice and clean aesthetically. Um, that's generally why people are going for it. Might be slightly less expensive than doing two separate units, but for serviceability or maybe for flow in the kitchen, you'd see yourself using one or the other in, in, in a different spot. But I personally think you can design them well and make it look pronounced that it's planned to be two separate ovens. And I like that better uh, just from a long-term life expectancy, serviceability kind of thing personally. Uh, one more about venting. If I purchase a 30 inch uh, oven or range, uh, do I need to purchase a hood that is 30 inches or wider? How does that work? Why yeah, venting 101, we'd love to see you go. I mean, if you read any venting book, they'll always tell you to oversize a hood by six inches. Um, more often than not, though, people do do 30 over 30. That's more common what you see. Looks better to me. Yeah, it does aesthetically. I mean, ninety percent of them are that way. You know, if it's if it's function if it's vented well and everything else, you're good. I'm a vent guy, but but you want your kitchen to look nice, right? especially if you yeah. get it done. Thirty six over thirty, just it just doesn't look yeah. right. Even though it's probably better for ventilation, I think in an island you oversize by six inches. Yeah, because it doesn't much matter. But on a um, on a wall, thirty six over thirty just doesn't look that good. Hmm. Uh, a question on induction. Um, what's our experience with induction cooktops? Uh, love the idea, but uh, seeing some info about EMF radiation. Um, first of all, I think induction is, is, is the best cooking source. 
It's more efficient, the easiest to clean. It's the most child safe. Um, uh, I'm not familiar with the EMF, and maybe I got to do some research on that, but anything a gas cooktop can do, uh, induction cooktop with the, except for maybe grilling, because obviously you're not going to grow in an open flame with induction. Um, anything that a gas can do, induction will do better. It's faster, it's got an infinite simmer capability. Um, you know, the Wolf ones get that four burners that you can join together, which is nice. Um, you create less. Um, you know, you could do a 400 CFM with an induction because you don't have that heat emission like you do in gas. Um, you know, it's a newer, you know, it's induction's newer, but it was invented in 1980. Gas is really just a bigger version of what was created in like the 1920s. You know, um, you get fancy, you could put like a soap plat between the pot and the, um, and the, uh, and the burner. And really, uh, and, and really have a much easier cleanup. So I'm a, I'm a big induction fan. That said, you know I didn't do the major cooking in my house, so I got a gas cooked, you know, um, yeah. which works fine. Yeah, and the EMF thing, I'll tell you this: it's 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 not necessarily proven. It's it's out there, and if you were to actually research that, you'd find that there's just as many people saying induction is perfectly safe versus not. Counter to that would be if you took a guilt and Googled the word phrase, uh, is a gas, does a gas range call, cause cancer uh, or could it be harmful? It'll tell you it puts off formaldehyde, uh, carbon monoxide. So I guess the answer to the question is you see, see this sometimes uh, and it's a good question because it, it does is out there, but there's probably not anything we use in our, our given life today that someone hasn't linked to cancer or some awful thing. So, um, I guess today it hasn't come out as proven, nor has as gas necessarily. And but, you know, I guess there's concerns with everything. So it's just you weighing out what, 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 where your level of concern is the least. But in terms of performance, to Steve's point, induction does perform very well. Maybe uh, one or two more, really quick here. Um, back to ventilation. Uh, manufacturers suggest 30 inch height above the range hood to, to size that hood. Um, on a 36 inch counter with a 36 inch clearance, that's five foot six inches. Um, if you're six feet tall, you may bash your forehead on that. How bad is it to go 36 inch above the counter to give yourself a little more room? You know, I'll tell you, I'm not on the floor as often as I was, but this is just like I was on the floor yesterday. I mean, that's, you're absolutely right. Uh, that question is brought up a lot. Um, again, it's yin and yang, a form and function. It's your home, you can do what you like. The only thing that I would tell you is the higher you go, smoke wants to go every which way, but directly up. And 30 inches is ideal. Um, if, you, if you're a 24 inch uh, deep hood, which, which most of the, the, the more powerful hoods are minimally, um, it's really what you need. And yeah, uh, 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 an average five foot seven to six foot person is gonna probably be right at their temple level kind of thing. Um, you learn to work around it. You've probably been in more kitchens that are that way. If you're extremely tall we, or, or it really bothers you, people raise them up, but you are going to start to compromise performance, no doubt. Uh, one more um, might be a good way to wrap it up. My contractor is behind on the project. What are possible remedies other than ending up in court to deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, wow. I would, Ricky, Ricky, this is this is one for you. I mean, I would, you I would stop by, by, by simply noticing, you know, obviously no activity at the at the site, and call he or she the contractor and ask for a meeting. And once that meeting does take place, uh, I I would I would ask that maybe to make up the slack, days lost, they, uh, they work weekends because typically contractors do work, uh, you know, Monday to Friday schedule. So, I mean, right then and there, you're gonna gain time to, uh, to, to make up for the time that, that's lost. I mean, again, it goes back to Stephen's point, you know, having that discussion in the beginning and pretty much interviewing your contractor and defining each step, uh, of the phase of the project. And one of those phases should be, you know, what is your policy on delays? I, I see it in your contract, you're gonna be working 
through Friday. What are, what are some of your ways to make up uh, for delays? And there are delays on every project. No, no matter who you get for a general contractor, there are uh, always going to be delays. And, and a good contractor will uh, forecast those delays and have a resolution ready to be presented to the client to, uh, you know, stop any further delays, I should say. Yeah, not knowing where you are in the country or who your contractor is, it's, we've all, we all have been a part of a delayed project if we've ever done any work around our house. But I, I will tell you, not in defense, I don't know the situation, but COVID is real and delays are real. I'm doing a project myself personally right now, a small one, which has gone on, should have been a month and has been five. Um, doesn't it, uh, you know, put you probably in a better spot in your project, but to put it all on contractors today or, or appliance salespeople or really anyone, it is it, not to use the excuse we're all getting tied up, but it is a pandemic and the delays are real. Um, materials are hard to come by and it changes by the day. Um, you know, there's also some contractors that the, the pile of product could be right there and he'd be on a delay. So, you know, hard to answer, but right now, we just, I think, I think if it's reasonable and to, to Ricky's point, sit down, have a reasonable conversation of what could I expect for a timeline moving forward? Because to end up in court, trust me, at the end of the day, you're not gonna have your project done any faster. You're gonna spend as much, if not more money, have to start back over. And if you're trying to find a contractor in today's market where every contractor is straight out busy, you're gonna pay it on top of that, on top of that, on top of that to even get anyone to take your project. And anyone that would, how great are they to be available? So you, you got a lot of things to think about. Uh, I think it's best for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think the last resort is you want to lawyer up. I mean, you want that relationship, at least the, the, the line of communication always to stay open. And I think if you get to the point where you're in the middle of a project, there's some major delays, you, you know, you, you bring in a lawyer in the mix and that there's, there's too much tension there. So that creates more delays or the fact that the contract is going to state, well, now that you have an attorney, uh, we're going to pull out, you know, so you want, you want to try to avoid that as much as possible. I think if you're uh, straightforward face to face and come up with a, a solution versus uh Prolonging the delays, I, I, I think it'd be a win-win for the client and the contractor. And the other thing that I would say is just to make sure that you're never ahead of your payments. So you're paying as, the, as, as your project is completed. So your project should be phased, spelt out in a contract, and you're releasing funds. If, if you're doing a big project, many times the bank is releasing you the funds as you phase out. But as you're doing that project, you're not you're not over over your toes on this. You're not out in front of it where you have, he has all your money and leverage at this point and isn't completing your job. Correct. Think about this, right? Your lawyer is gonna charge you what, 250 to 500 bucks an hour, a Boston lawyer. Their lawyer is gonna charge him 250 to 500 bucks an hour. You're gonna be, you know, someone's paying a thousand bucks an hour. Um, and again, Ricky, communication, understanding, and where do we go from here? Those are your best things. That's your best bet. You know, staying out of court is always just a great idea. It's just a waste of your money, but more importantly, your time. You can be more productive than sitting around in civil court. It's just and annoying. and do do your homework on on he or she, the contractor. You know, reach out to their their subs that they use all the time, and kind of interview them based on the contractor you're you're willing to hire. I mean. Uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta meet your budget, but sometimes spend a little more, the end result, you'll end up saving. For people, absolutely spend more. Those questions were all yours. I mean, I only highlighted the, you know, the, the ones that I like the best. But. Yep. All right, let's wrap up there. Um, tons of great questions. We'll, we'll dig into the questions we haven't gotten to today. Uh, we will be following up with the recording of this. So everybody will receive an email. Who, everyone who registered will receive an email uh, with the recording. We'll include, um, so you'll be able to contact us through that email. Um, you see on the screen now, our next webinar is 
focusing on kitchen appliance trends. We'll talk about new products and, uh, and trends to consider. Um, a lot later. We'll include a link to that one as well. So you can register for that if that interests you. Uh, and with that, Pat, can I jump in? I am going to be disruptive. There's one question that was asked ahead of time that I really do want to answer um, before the, the webinar, and we'll get to the rest of them. It was they were trying to plan. They didn't want to have paralysis and planning a kitchen moving forward. And how could they plan some things that gives them flexibility as appliances do tend to break? So there, there's one main thing we get stuck with with a lot, and it's the refrigerator space. If you're doing a high-end custom built-in refrigerator, well, then the space is the space and you're going to have to, to make it look the way it needs to look to be built to that exact specification. But if you're everyone else, specifically the refrigerator causes us a lot of, a lot of headache. The standard size you should be thinking about is 36 inches. That, is, that gives you a lot of options, folks. That's what you want. If this thing dies, what do I have a lot of options in? Price ranges, things change. 36 inches is what you want to focus on. In terms of height, fridges vary in height. But generally what we tell you to do is whether you're picking a fridge that's 70 inches tall or 72, those are very common sizes. If you're not doing a built-in refrigerator, a pro really expensive one, I would tell you to plan that upper cabinet to have 72 inches of height in your opening and produce a filler that can be shaved up or down should that fridge die to be able to accommodate one that's slightly more expensive. So they don't have to rip out all the cabinets. It's just a couple of screws. I've even seen some people pay the extra small bit of money to have two fillers matched in the color cabinets when they first built their kitchen. So they have that flexibility, uh, you know, if there was something that went wrong. Good that idea. would just be one thing that I wanted to point out. That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I digress, but it was. Now, it was Pat, you can, you, can, you, can, you can continue the epilogue of the. Uh, <laughs> It's all good, uh, all good. Tons of great questions today. Um, we will be in touch with the recording tomorrow. And um, as always, if any questions come up, you can reach out to us. And with that, thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.